Okay, welcome back. Let's get started for today. Thank you. Let me find a light switch and then let's get started. Okay, so on Friday, uh, David told you about categories and databases. And in particular, a category is this this world where we have these things called objects, which might be some sort of algebraic object, like a, a set or a vector space or a group, or it might be considered as some sort of type or some trait in, in some sort of programming sort of language system. Um, and then associated objects, we also have these things called morphisms, uh, or associated to a category. So a morphism goes between objects. Uh, you might think of it as something like a function or a group on morphism, or in other examples, it's say a program taking data of one type to, into a data of another type. So, after talking about this, towards the end, David started to give it a bit meta and to start and started to consider the, the category of categories. So, if categories were themselves to be objects in the category, we need an associated notion of morphism to two categories. And, and David called these functors. So, and then, sort of reflecting on what, what sort of thing a function, functor should have, he sort of spoke about these ideas of um, elements or, or data and then structure in the property and said that uh, some sort of morphism between some sort of algebraic object should take the data to other data and should preserve these, these structures. And so today we're going to unpack that and, and give you a, a formal definition of the notion of a functor and look at how this preserves, sends data to data and preserves from that structure. Okay. So one, this. So, having said what I just said, I'll get straight to a definition. Um, so, fix some categories C and C and D, and we say a functor writing M from C to D is, I'll give you the data, um, it's firstly a function, which I'll also call f, from the objects of C to the objects of D, and it's another function for all objects, um, x, y, in, I'll just write C since I've said objects, but otherwise x, y, in the objects of C, we have another function uh, from the morphisms from x to y to the set of morphisms from f of x to f of y, where f, so x is an x and y are objects of C, so f turns them into objects of D, and so we can talk about the set of morphisms between f of x and f of y. All right. So this is David said that a functor or, or any sort of algebraic thing should take data to data. So the data of a category, categories consist of objects and morphisms, and so I've told you how to take objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms. But we also have some, some properties, or some structures that this thing should preserve. So such that, um, firstly, every, so every object in a category, we associate an identity morphism. So uh, functors, should send identity morphisms to identity morphisms. So for all objects x, we should have that f of the identity morphism of x is equal to the identity morphism of f of x. And secondly, so this is called preserves identities. And the other bit of structure we have associated with categories is a composition rule. So it should also preserve this. So this is for all um, morphisms f and g, so that they may be composed. We should have that if we take the image of f and we take the image of g and compose them, that's equal to the image of f composed with g. This is preserves composition. So again, we have what the function does in data and some properties that say preserve structure. 
there is, so David also spoke about associated to every morphism, a domain and a codomain. So another way of viewing this definition, and, and you might view sort of domain and codomain as certain structure in the category. So another way of viewing this definition is that this thing is really a function from the morphisms of C, so all of the home sets to all of the home sets of D, um, but such that the domain of a morphism of F, so, so if we have F from X to Y, remember that we call X the domain and Y the codomain, and we want the domain of that F of this object, which is the domain of F, to equal the domain of F of F. And similarly for the codomain, the thing on the right. Um, but you can take this stuff in white as, as a definition, and that just as another viewpoint. OK, so some examples. First, I want to talk about functors between uh, presentations, because it's partly because this gives a, a nice picture. So here's some sort of presentation of one category. Here's a presentation of another category. What is a functor between these two things? Well, a functor takes objects to objects first of all. So it's going to send, um, so for every object here, there are three. We say, well, this object should go here, this object might go here. Um, and let's say for now that this object goes here. Okay. It's, but it's also going to send morphisms to morphisms, and in a way that sends, so there are two viewpoints. Firstly, if it sends a morphism from, it has to send a morphism from x to y to a morphism from f of x to f of y. So we call this grouping x. So here's an object x, uh, well here's a morphism from x to, here's an object x, here's an object y, and we think of this as a morphism from x to y. So in particular then, it's got to go to a morphism from f of x to f of y. And there's only one here, it's, it's this one here. There's two. There's two. Oh, there's a path. Oops, sorry. Um, now there's only one. <laughs> <laughs> Fixed it. Um, but we could have chosen either one in any case. Um, but what I want to say is that we might say send this morphism to this morphism. Um, so we've also got to send, say, this morphism somewhere. Um, and so where should we send this morphism? Well, it's going to be a morphism from this, op this object to itself. And it doesn't look like there's a morphism there in the presentation, but there is always a morphism there. And it's called the identity morphism. It's the path of length zero. So we can send this morphism to, well, this sort of, uh, just the identity morphism on here. So that's, that's how you can sort of think of a functor. It's a way of, I mean, this, the structure I've drawn here is somewhat like a graph on morphism. It's sending edges to, Either it's sending edges to paths and points to points. Um, so, in particular, any graph morphism, so anything that sends edges to edges and points to points, preserving domain, codomain, or source and target, will induce a, a functor between the two categories that the graphs present. Okay, so that's a first example of a functor. Um, secondly, so this is a uh, presentation. Uh, an example, um, effectively of the same type, but maybe with a bit more sort of suggestive semantic content, is an example between database schemas. Um, so you might have a database schema, say, for for just storing airline seats, um, and so we might have two types of seats: economy seats and first class seats. Um, and to every seat we associate price, whether it be economy or first class, and to every economy seat we associate so the 
name of the passenger there, and similarly to the first car seat. So that's one database schema. Um, another de simpler database schema for storing the same sort of data would just be to have a notion of seat. And then we have price and streams associated to it. And so one might, two different companies, might use these two database schema and want to talk about some sort of relationship between them which would help them understand how to migrate data from that that's stored in this format to data that's stored in this format. So you can describe that relationship with a functor, which is sort of the obvious one that sends this uh, sort of the, the numbers object to the numbers object, or the price object to the price object, the string object to the string object, and both seed objects to the single seat object of this schema. And then it will send these, these morphisms to the, the corresponding ones there. OK. So that's that. Um, I'm gonna, sorry for the movement. What I'm going to talk about next. Um, so another thing I've told you then is that Categories are both generalizations of, of monoids and preorders. And Dave was spoken a lot about preorders. So I want to just consider what a functor is in those two examples. So functors between preorders. Um, and well, uh, these will be monotone maps. Okay. So recall, uh, let's just suppose here the category C and D are preorders. So we have C. The pre-order notation we have is just a set and a uh, order relation or binary relation, which turns out to be the order. Um, so suppose these are pre-orders. Um, then uh, let's let's consider what a functor is between them. Oh, okay. Let me remind you first um, this sort of perspective about pre-orders and categories. So we write a pre um we write for the concepts sort of C, X, Y is, is either empty or not. Um, and we write sort of, uh, uh, right. we write X is less than Y if C, if this element has, if this thing has a, an element and not if it's empty, right? So x is not less than y if, if this home set here is empty. Okay, so what then is a functor? Um, first, it's a, it's a function from the objects of C, which is just the set C of elements, to the objects of D. Um, and two, so it's, it's a morphism from home set. So it's a morphism from C, uh, so, sorry, it's a function from Cxy to D of f of x, D of y. Uh, D, F of, sorry, D of f of x, f of y. Um, but what this turns out to mean, uh, where this, this only really turns out to be a, an important thing um, if this home set has one element. Um, and in particular, 2 turns out to be the constraint that says that if this home set has an element, then the corresponding home set from D has to have an element. So the corresponding home set D has an element, we write that f of x is less than f of y, or I might write C and D as subgroups. Question? Question? Quick question. Just what's, what's written within the curly braces in the top right? Oh, that's just a, it's a one, it's meant to be a one element set. Um, so you can call your element whatever you want. I'll call it smiley face now. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so, Functors between pre-orders, I mean, okay, so there's some conditions to check uh, what does the ident what does it mean to preserve identities and what does it preserve mean to preserve compositions in the setting. But roughly you've seen this sort of stuff before. It's a function between the elements that preserves the order. Um, and I'll leave you to explore the details in the problem time. Um, next though, I want to talk about uh, monomorphisms. So We've talked about monoids. We haven't talked about monoid homomorphisms, but you may have seen them. Uh, if you haven't in particular seen monoid homomorphisms, you may have seen group homomorphisms, where groups are a particular type of monoid. 
but really it's, it's a function between two monoids that preserves the monoid operation. Um, so what does, so suppose um, C and D are monoids. Um, what, should, what should this data say in that case? Well, I says that uh, there's a function from objects of C to objects of D. But as monoids, monoids are one object categories, so C and D only have one object. So this thing says, condition one says nothing. Condition two asks for a function between, um, between the home sets. So condition two wants a function from C, um, and I'm just going to write C because it has a unique object, so C, the, all the morphisms in C, to all the morphisms in D. Right. In fact, that's right. Um, just the operations as sort of times, maybe. C times and D times. OK, so this is the data. It's a function from this set to this set, the set of objects to the set of, uh, sorry, the set of morphisms to the set of morphisms, such that uh, we have two conditions. First, it sends the identity element to the identity element. F1 and C is 1 and D. And second, this notion of preserving composition. So here we started writing composition as times because we're thinking of this as monoid. And so it says that F of F times G is equal to F of F times F of G. Yeah? Why should we write nothing in first? Ah, OK. So if you look at this definition, um, one asks for a function from the objects of C to the objects of D. Um, but we're now we're considering the case of monoids. And monoids are categories with one object. Um, there's, a, um, I, uh, there's a question on the problem sheet to explore that further. Um, but taking that for granted, then one is asking for a function from one element set to one element set. Um, but that's sort of, there's only a unique function, so it's not really any data to consider. So I've just written nothing to represent that. So, so examples there of monohomomorphisms, you might consider, just say, the integers as a one object, uh, as a monoid, so as a one object category. So every integer is a, is a, is a morphism. Um, and composition of morphisms is just, uh, let's say, multiplication of integers. Um, then there's a functor, say, from Z to Z, a monohomomorphism from z to z, which is, say, multiplication, I guess squaring. Right, so it sends a natural number, uh, sorry, an integer to the integer squared. So this is an example of a functor. OK. Um, let me give you um, so far, we've considered sort of functors between categories which have the same sort of flavor. So they're both pre-orders, or they're both modern homomorphisms. Um, next, I want to talk about how database instances are an example of a functor. So this is the um, database instances. So we're seeing the, the category of sets. Just to remind you, set has, the ob has objects, sets, and morphisms are functions. Um, and so um, if we pick some database schema, say that one over here, uh, over, over there with the seats. Um, seat. Let's see, string. An instance of this database is a functor from this cat this database schema is a functor from this category to set. So what does this mean? To every object of here, we associate a set. So I'm going to say to the object, which I'm just which I've just called dollar sign, I'm going to associate a set of positive real numbers. And to the object called seat, I'm going to associate the set which has, say, all seats in the plane, 1A, 1B, all the way down to 32F or something like that. Um, and then to string, I'm just going to associate uh, 
the set of strings in, uh, let's say, the standard alpha version space. So this sends each object of here to an object in set. And also, the functor also asks us to send each morphism in here to a, a morphism in set between the images of the object. So it's going to send this arrow to a function. And what function is it going to be? Uh, let's send it to, um, let's see, it's going to send C to dollar sign to some function which, which I'm going to call price from these seats, line A and so on, to the positive row numbers. And then we also need a function that sends um, seats to, to strings. So it sends, and we'll call it this sort of passenger. So it sends, takes a seat and tells you the name of the person who's sitting in that seat. Okay. Implicitly, there are a few morphisms, more morphisms in this category, right? There's an identity morphism on, say, this, this price object here. But we're going to send that. We know we already have to send identity morphisms to identity morphisms, so it goes to the constant or the identity function from the positive row numbers to itself. Yeah. So I think we represent the arrows in the set because the set has no structure. It's just like the dots, right? Uh, which set? Sorry. This this category set or? Yeah. How do you represent the functions at the bottom of the set? I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, I, I, I thought it's going to be like a forgetful functor that forgets all structure and only keeps the objects and no homomorphisms. But like somehow you kept the homomorphisms? Um, let's, I don't know. Um, so this is a category with three objects and five morphisms. So, and we have a functor to the category of sets. So for every object of here, we get a set. And for, which is an object in this category. And for every morphism in here, we get a function between the sets, which is a morphism in this category. Right? Well, yeah, in this category. So that's, that's what I'm writing out here. I've written out the sort of two interesting places, that, well, where the two interesting morphisms go, and the other morphisms are identity morphisms. OK. Um, but maybe this is a good place to, to start for a question. So. Some discussion. Actually, one more example, and then I'll give you a bit of time to discuss. Uh, for those who have seen a bit more math, it might be enlightening to sort of think about algebraic topology, um, which considers uh, a category top of, of topological spaces where the morphisms are continuous maps, um, and it also considers categories like the category of groups, uh, where the morphisms are group polymorphisms, and Fun these constructions that people often talk about, like the fundamental group, so I'm just going to use that one, or maybe homology is another common one, uh, it, uh, form functors from topological, the category of topological spaces to the ta uh, category of groups. So in particular, uh, something like the fundamental group construction not only takes a space and gives you a group, but it takes a, a continuous map and turns it into a group homomorphism between the, what are known as the homotopy groups. So, I know not everyone has studied algebraic topology, but this is sort of the origin of the subject of category theory, and it's, it's just a very interesting application. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'll give you two questions, um, or three, let's say. Um, what are functors? So, if C is a category, what are functors from, say, this one other object? One, one object category to set, uh, to see, I've got that, I've got that one. Uh, what are functors from two to set? And then maybe what are functors from three to, sorry, either set or city. So, and then pick a neighbor, discuss what's been happening so far, and maybe see if you can construct an answer to these questions. This is a based on. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. So, first one should be
Sam points out that you need base tablet and point to tablet and four ten rounds of four. Probably not worth it. Yeah. 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 says that it's a map from objects to objects, and then given in two objects, it's a map from objects of the first, the sort of fun, uh, morphisms between those objects to morphisms between the images of those objects. Um, but an equivalent way to say that, which is slightly more in line with this sort of data, or, or this sort of element structure, property picture, that David talked about on Friday, is to think of it as not having a, um, not sort of quantifying over these objects and saying we have a function for each pair of objects, but just saying we have a function from morphisms to morphisms. Um, but how does that become the same thing? Well, there are certain structures associated with morphisms that need to be preserved. And so those structures are called domain and codomain. And so it says that the domain of a morphism in C, uh, when we take its image using this function uh, here in as an object in D is the same as the domain object of the image of that morphism. So, um, just to introduce a diagram. So we have this sort of set of morphisms in C, and we want to get to some sort of object in D. Um, and we can 
take it, take the morphism in C and use this function to turn it to a morphism in D, and then take the domain. Or we can take the domain in C, which gives us an object in C, and map it to an object in D. And we want those two things to be the same. So we say, we draw the symbol and say it commutes. Um, and so that's, that's just another way of viewing the structure. So, that, so saying that we have a map from morphisms to morphisms that obeys this thing that is preserves domains and codomains um, is the same as saying for each x and y we have a, a function. Okay. Any other questions? So I guess forgive me for uh, sort of asking about notation. Mm -hmm. uh, in the when we're talking about the like from the schema to set uh, for the actual definition of like the the functor, you use like a new arrow. I guess. Oh, this thing. Yeah. So so this is my notation for a, a morphism, but in this sort of a, a function-like thing, um, and this is a notation for what it does. On, um, on particular data. Um, so it comes from the sort of clearest, well, if you're talking about functions between sets, often you write sort of we have a function f from x to y, and then well, let's say from the real numbers to the integers. And we write, it takes a real number, and then it maps that to I know, the floor of that real number. Okay. So, this is the name of the function, and this is for sort of a maps to arrow that says what's happening on particular elements of the set. Um, and this is sort of in this notation is in that character. Okay, so answers to these questions. If I have a functor from the one object category to set uh, to C, what's how do I understand that? We get one such for every object in C. Right. They're the same as objects in C. Um, what about if I have a, a functor from this category here, code 2 to C? The same as the morphisms in C. Right. So because the domains and codomains have to preserve, once I know where this morphism goes, I know where this object and this object have to go, and where the identity morphism of those two objects have to go. So despite the fact that this has three morphisms and two objects, uh, the, or the, to specify the data of this functor is the same as choosing a morphism in C. Or you can say that a functor from 2 to C just chooses a morphism in C. What about 3? Choosing, choosing a pair that can be composed. Right. Um, so it chooses two things, but they have the constraint that the domain of, uh, the codomain of this error morphism has to be the domain of this morphism. So that means they're composable. Um, they go sort of head to tail as in that diagram, but now in C. So it might be a function from x, uh, x to y and, and then a function from y to, to z, but it can't be a function from x to y and from a to b if C was set. Okay, great. Now I want to talk about naturality. Okay, so. Category theory comes from about the 40s, from algebraic topology. Um, and in particular, it comes because Eilenberg and MacLean, the sort of originators of the subject, were trying to sort of describe in what sense certain constructions like the fundamental group uh, were natural. Um, so natural transformations themselves are the sort of right notion of, of morphism between functor. So we have categories, we have morphisms of categories, which are functors, and we have morphisms of functors, which are natural transformations. Um, and the point is, as you get to this stage, it, it helps capture exactly what you mean when you say a certain construction is, is natural. So I want to talk briefly about these. So let's do it. Um, a definition. So if we have some fun two categories, C and D, and we have two functors between them. Let's call them f and g. Um, so that's, that's that. Then the functors. Um, a natural transformation between them, uh, which 
I might actually write in the same notation. So I'm going to call it alpha, and it's an error between f and g. Um, is <coughs> for each object of c, uh, so for each x in c, um, a, a morphism from in g and d from, so I'm going to call this morphism a morphism alpha at x from f of x to g of x. Okay. And it has a condition known as the naturality condition, such that um, for all for all morphisms in C, uh, we have this commuting square. So we start We have a, a morphism alpha x from f of x to g of x, but we also have a morphism called alpha y from f of y to g of y. And now, given any morphism in C from f of x to y, our functor f gives us a morphism from f of x to f of y, called f of x, f of f, and our functor g gives us a morphism from g of x to g of y for g of f. That's so a naturality says that this must commute. So I think I didn't get to that before. So um, I'm going to call this function f again. So if we take a morphism f in here, its image is going to be called f of f coming here. And similarly, if it was for the function g, its image was called g of f. Okay. So, examples. Um, if we go back to that example over there and just talk about um, functors from 1 to one to C, say, one to some category, right? So these are the same as objects. So let's say we have two objects in C. I'm going to abuse notation, just call them functors from one to C, called X and Y. And what is a natural transformation alpha between these two things? Well, for each X, it's a, it's a morphism from F of X to G of Y. So I, it's a morphism from F of the, so X of the unique object in here, which we call, we call X, and y of the unique object in here, which we call y. Such that for all morphisms, but the only morphism in here is the identity morphism, um, and for that, this square immediately commutes. So I, a, a natural transformation from 1 to c is just a morphism in c. Second example, um, just from, from presentations, or another way of seeing this concept, is that say I had to consider a morphism from two to from two to some category here. So let me draw a functor f, and we can send this object to this object, this object to this object, and sort of this arrow here to, to this arrow here. Um, so, in other words, a functor is a way of taking this sort of picture and finding it or placing it inside this picture over here. So if I have another way of doing that, uh, let's send that there, and that there, and send this arrow to here. I might want a way of comparing the sort of two different images of, of this, this category inside here. I call this one way is what's called G and one way is called F. So how do I do that? Um, natural transformation says we sort of need 
for every object, so for this object, we need a way of saying, taking how we put that object inside here under the yellow map F to how we put it there under the, into this category under the blue map G. Um, and similarly for the other object. And we need sort of the fact that this square commutes. So this, this category here would have to obey the equation that says that this thing, this path here is equal to this path here. So I, this thing is a natural transformation. When A, B, C, A, then B, C, then B. So then <coughs> it's a commutative square in C? Yeah, okay. a natural transformation is a commutative square. And so a natural transformation from one is just a morphism, a natural transformation from two is a commutative square. So the natural transformation is a name of a way to go from yellow to blue. Um, so there can be many natural transformations between two functors. Um, and yeah, in fact, that's what I'm just going to get to briefly. Um, so other examples, another way to think about a natural transformation, um, for those of you who have done, done some computer science, is it's, it's a polymorphic function. Um, so an example of a polymorphic function is something like flatten, which takes a list of lists and turns it back into a list. Um, it doesn't matter whether they're lists of, of numbers or lists of uh, characters, you can always do that thing. Um, and what's, what, what's more, uh, if you put, if you sort of have a way of transforming numbers into uh, strings of letters, um, you can either sort of do that before you flatten your list or do that after you flatten your list and you get the same result. And so that's ex precisely an expression of naturality. Uh, I gather that uh, there are uh, pairs of functors that do not have a natural transformation between them. Yes. So if you look at the uh, relation, uh, there exists a natural transformation mm -hmm. between uh, a pair of functors. Mm -hmm. That's going to be an equivalence relation? Um, no. No. So, for example, there exists a morphism between something is not an equivalence relation. Uh, there exists a morphism is not an equivalence relation, right? So, for example, if I have just this category too, uh, there exists a morphism from here to here, but not, but it's not reflect symmetric. It's not symmetric because there's no morphism from here to here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, let's see. So, yeah. Uh, so, I just wanted to understand the polymorphic uh, mm -hmm. example. Uh, so, it, is it that you're saying that if you have a way of making arbitrary lists, if you have a way of making like this of lists of integers mm -hmm. into flat lists, mm -hmm. then from that you can, through a natural transformation, deduce how you can make list of lists of strings into flat lists of strings? Um, so, flatten is the name of the natural transformation, and it says if you have It's the, so you can sort of flatten a, a generic list, but it, whether it be lists of uh, numbers, lists of numbers or lists of uh, strings. Right. F, F, is F, is, F, F is list. F is list of lists. Okay, sorry, F sorry. is list of lists. F is list of lists. G is um, G list. G is list. And the X, is, X is integers and Y is string. strings. Strings, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And he's saying that, does, but anything, any, sorry, I'm interrupting. No, that's fine. But any, no matter where you um, flatten works, no matter what your data type is. And it work, and you can map across, you can map any function across flatten. So if yeah. you have a way of turning strings into integers, then you can flatten, when you flatten a list of lists of strings, and then turn it into a list of integers, you, you, you could have done it the other order. That's the polymorphic naturality thing. Mm -hmm. So in particular, this sort of alpha is this idea of flatten, 
and it takes as an argument your data type. Uh, okay, quick questions. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to move on quickly, but we've got time at the end of class. So, yeah, come up and answer, ask questions then. Okay, so... Let's say... Um, Well, I'm going to say that functors and, and natural transformations form a category. So I, uh, given categories, C and D, um, there is a category, which is written like this, where objects um, are functors. So this means this means in particular that there's this notion of an identity natural transformation and a and composing natural transformations. Um, so this is called the functor category. And then in particular. Um, we, so, given a database schema, so a finitely presented category, uh, let's just call it C, um, we say that the set of functors, so we saw that a functor from a schema to set is a database instance, and we call this functor category then uh, is the category of C instances. So this is it's an important sort of way to structure how how database instances of a particular schema are related to each other. And also, as you talk about functors between categories, you can talk about functors between these categories of, of instances. And that becomes a, a very structured way to talk about uh, data migration. Um, so we've got Ryan up the back, who founded, along with David, this, this company, Categorical Informatics, which sort of built software, commercial-grade software, to do precisely this, to talk about structured data migration. Um, so he's a great person to talk to. He's here today. Um, if you want to, say, do a project with him for your third assignment, or you just want to do, think about the sort of stuff, um, he's great to talk to. And there are also projects on uh, Categorical data.net. Um, yeah, there's a, so the software is called AQL, and there's a free open source implementation of it there, which is fun to play around with. Okay. Um, let's see. I wanted to, let me see if in the last five minutes I can tell you a bit about universal constructions in, in categories. So we started to see some universal constructions uh, for pre-orders in, in the second lecture, and we saw that there's this notion of, say, meet and join, which generalizes a bunch of things. Um, it generalizes things like and and all, there exists and for all, it generalizes uh, LCD and, I'm sorry, GCD and LCN, um, unions and intersections. Um, but this notion the, these notions can be generalized further in the context of categories to encompass even more sort of natural <coughs> constructions people like to think about. So, let me just quickly make a note about universality. Um, so, we saw in particular the notion, so something, something to know then is that the notion of product can be seen as an example of a, of a universal construction, um, say the product of sets, and hence sort of also in this family of things like meets, um, so like uh, intersections and and so remember if we have a, sort of two sets A B C the product of the set was this sort of set of order pairs um, <coughs> A two A three B2, B3. Um, 
And we saw this notion of Galois connection, which can now be generalized to a notion of a junction. So a Galois and a junction um, just like a Galois connection was a pair of functors and a junction, oh sorry, a pair of modular maps. And a junction is a pair of functors going in the other in opposite directions. Um, such that there's this bijection between home sets. Um, so if we pick a an object of, of D and map it into C according to sorry. That's not right. If we pick an object of, of D and map it into of, of C and map it into D according to F, um, that's here. And the morphisms from, from the image to some other object in D are in bijection um, with the morphisms from X to the image of the image of Y. All right. So an adjunction is a pair of functors in opposite directions such that we have bijections between home sets in a natural way, where natural is sort of captured by this notion of natural transformation. Um, then, So this is a generalization of the, the definition of Galois connection. And let's see, there's this fact that meets can be understood as some sort of adjunction or, some, or arising from a Galois connection with respect to the diagonal. So given any poset P, we have a map from P to P times P, which just duplicates that element. So we call that delta for diagonal. Um, and so this has an adjoint, and in fact, the adjoint is, is meets. Um, so what does this mean? In this particular case, it means that, um, recalling the definition of Galois connection, that <coughs> the diagonal of something is less than some arbitrary element in P times P, if and only if, so this is what I mean by this double line, if and only if P is less than the meet of x and y. Um, so in this generalization to categories where we talk about some notion of product, um, so let's just talk about product and set, we have some functor from set to set times set um, called the diagonal, so it's sends a <coughs> call the set p again to p times p, and sends a function between sets to just doing the same function on each, each point or each factor. Um, this thing has an adjunction, or an adjoint, a right adjoint. And that right adjoint is called product, uh, which means exactly that, that construction there. So in particular, this sort of map since it takes a pair of sets to the product of those two sets. Um, and how we understand this is related to that is that another way to characterize the product is by this sort of uh, bijection between home sets in this sort of way. So in particular, um, there's functions from p comma p to x comma x are in one-to-one -one correspondence in a natural way with functions, sorry, this is set time set, um, from p to x times x. And how does this work? Well, if you have a sort of a common p, with some function from x and function to y, then we can extract a function to x times x by just taking sort of the pair of that thing. So in particular, it sends an element p to the pair, sort of, so it sends p in here to f of p, g of p. Um, and to go back the other way, we can take the projection. So if you have a map from p to x times y, um, then we can just say, well, where does it send it, the element in the first factor, and where did it send the element in the second factor? And that gives a correspondence between these two sets, um, which precisely generalizes this notion of, of Galois connection here. But again, instead of asking whether there's a way from getting from one object to another, we now talk about the set of all ways to get 
from one object to another. Um, so I think I'll end there. Um, please ask if you have any questions. This is a fast lecture, so feel free to stick around and ask questions. There's, we have half an hour at least to do that. So. Yeah.